Hi, I'm Jim. And I'm David. And And this this is the Practical Practical Guitarist Guitarist Podcast. Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. The Practical Guitarist Podcast is brought to you by Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Great Lakes Guitar Pickups provides fantasy tones at prices a practical guitarist will love. Featuring top-notch construction, attention to detail, and a fully custom product, if you can dream it, Great Lakes Guitar Pickups can probably build it. Follow them on Facebook at facebook.com slash Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Are you a regular listener? Why not? David here reminding you of all the ways you can participate in the Practical Guitarist Podcast. Subscribe using your chosen podcast app. Review us on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or Google Play. Find our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash practical guitarist or on Twitter as at Pract Guitarist. Support the show. Merchandise is available in our Threadless store at practicalguitaristpodcast.threadless.com and donate to us via Patreon available at patreon.com slash practical guitarist. Reach out to us directly via email at questions at practicalguitarist.com. Hi, Jim. Hey, David. I, um, man, I, I've been doing a lot of practical guitarist work today. I know you have. You and I've been doing other stuff. I, you saw that video. Like, we got a new video coming, everybody. It's a big one. Nice. So get this. Get this right. We have a pedal that I guarantee you you've never heard before because there's only one of them in existence. Yeah. You have... Uh, the analog man king of tone in this pedal or in this video. And you're also going to have the brand new Mesa Boogie California. Oh, I, oh my God. I got to get a video of me playing that thing too. Cause I, I played one the other day and I was like, oh crap. I do like it. Oh no. Yeah, so, and here's the thing. Like it's a single channel amp. I know. I know. And I that, didn't want to like it. And what they should have done. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I think, I think Mesa missed the, the mark on They missed the mark. <laughs> yeah. There's a Mesa Boogie joke for you guys. Um, yeah. I think they missed the mark on this because what they should have done was they should have done a tweed with, with two channels, just yeah. like the Fillmore, right? Yeah, yeah. And bit, slightly bigger cabinet. The, tweed, the, the cabinet for the, uh, for the California is part of the allure, though, because it's, it's semi-closed back. Yeah. So you get all that low end, but it still breathes like an old tweed, um, tweed amp. And yeah. uh, actually, it was funny because the, the people that I was with today – they didn't necessarily like the amp a lot, but I'm like, no, dude, like this thing was really, really good. I, I, I actually enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. And we only played it on the two watt mode. So wow. know, we had to turn I wrote that video. I was like, oh, that sounds nice. Oh, it was loud. And it was at two watts. Yeah. It wow. was loud enough that I'm sure the, uh, the bar next door was like, what are you guys doing over there? Um, <laughs> but, but it was, it was good times. Good times uh, at good time music. <clears throat> that sounds awesome. So, Hopefully we'll see more videos from you. And yeah, you. I kind of want I'm hoping that like Jeff and I can do this every once in a while on a Sunday. I just go in and we'll like play some stuff and do different things and then we can promote the store and we can promote the podcast at the same time, which is awesome. Um yep. I don't even work for these guys and I like going in there because I get to sell stuff to people. And this it's really fun. fun. Yeah, it is. It fun. is. You know, uh, people have have uh, mistaken me for a salesman so many times at Guitar Center. And I never correct them. You know why? Because I love giving people, you know, good advice. I just like, like. And I love to see the look on their face when they walk out. Exactly. The the when they find what they want and yeah. they get that, like, really excited thing, like, it, it just does it for me. So I've yeah. always joked, like, in retirement, that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a music store. So. Yeah, I, uh, I've been thinking the same thing. I'd love to, love to do it. You know, I mean, how many people, that's, that's what they did, you know? Um, sure, sure. Mom and pops. So, um, unfortunately, the mom and pops that become uh, – I, I want to talk a little bit about that since we're talking about mom and pop type things. So the ones that become chains it, – it, so I was in the um, uh, musical round, which should be like a mom and pop, right? Yeah. They're, they're, they, they only yeah. sell used stuff. For the most yeah. part, everything in there is used. Unless you're looking at like strings or shit like that, they are pretty much used. Yet. They don't budge on the price. And yeah, I, and and they so, they have a they have like a um, blue book too that they use that that yeah. that corporate provides them. Yeah. So I mean, it doesn't matter what the condition is. Like they they just they won't wiggle on anything. Nope. And 
and actually I can remember when there were a lot more of those stores before guitar center basically ran them out of town. Um, and I can remember them being pretty reasonable, but like when I look online now, I don't see anything that I would like pay that amount of money for from them. So it's, and, and the terrible thing is they have zero re, I mean, they have a return policy, 10 day return policy. And then it gets worse. Not only is it 10 day return policy, when you return it, you get credit. You can't get your money back. You get yeah. Credit. Yeah. Um, you know who else has a 10 day report term policy, right? No. Kiesel. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're you, past that bitch. <laughs> you, you order it. Well, no, I'm keeping that Kiesel. Let me tell you. I know. I'm um, just saying you're past that. Yeah. No, way past that. Um, but it's funny because if you buy one, like any of the really cool options or what they call option 50, and then you can't return it. So you it's like it your, your $10 guarantee or your 10 day guarantee is crap. You know, yep. basically get it home, play it, and then throw it back in the box and send it back if you don't like it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I, so I'm, I'm gonna make this public in the group. I'm, I'm gonna buy another Kiesel. It's gonna happen. Um, okay. it, the question is when. Um, and I already know which one I'm getting. Like I, pr I pretty much have it down to the final spec. I just gotta start selling stuff to finance it. Um, yeah. And I, but here's the bigger news, right? So we've been talking about this, and I think I brought it up on the show a couple times. I'm looking at getting another one. Um, I am, I'm in love with seven string guitars right now. Like to the point where. Yeah. I played sixes all day today and I was like out of my element. Um, and I was <laughs> continuously reaching for the seventh string, like doing these runs and I'm going, where is it? Where is it? At? And you, you, I think when this video comes out, you'll see me a couple times where like the, where like I completely miss with the pick. I'm like, what's going on here? Wait a minute. Oh yeah. Cause you're, you're going for that string. But the cool thing is though, that because it's a B string, there are so many notes in common, yep. like in the way, in the way that like the, the fifth, you know, yeah. like the, the, that fifth relationship that you can get away yeah. with it. Even yeah. if you are kind of, <laughs> this isn't normally what I do. But I will say this. I played two guitars today. I played, um, I played a GNL ASAT and I played a uh, PRS right? Studio Vela Starla. Starla. That thing was nice. Yeah, it sounded okay. Um, <sighs> I, I, I didn't like those guitars initially. I played a couple of them now. Um, but the one I played today was, was a cut above the rest of them. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, that one seemed to sound really nice. Well, I think it's also the amp. I think well, that Mesa Boogie California. California. Yeah, that it was coming through the California. The California is pretty cool. Um, and, the, and the pedals. Yeah, yeah. So the, the pedals are one thing. You know, like, we'll talk about those when the, when the video comes out. But, but the amp, like in that video, um, Good Times got them. So if you're interested in one, you can probably look them up and get one there. Uh, they're just a really cool little combo. I think yeah. that I don't even know how many watts they are, but I know like there's like 10 different settings on the watt selector. So now I got a silly question for you. So if I, if I have a local Mesa dealer, okay. Yep. Make, make it, but if I decide to go, which I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to get one probably in March or April of next year. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm wondering is, this is my question for you. Um, and you might have to ask them. If I went to order one, if I said, geez, you know, I got to order one anyway, or, you know, then would they have it shipped from Mesa to me or would they, I mean, how would it go about that? Or should That's I That's a good question. Um, I think they, so I know that they could for sure make that happen. Um, and usually what would end up happening is my assumption is they would take it in. They would probably unbox it, make sure everything's cool. And yeah. then they would ship it out to you. Um, and they would probably be cool doing that. Like, to be honest with you, uh, that would just be for their own selfish purposes on the warranty. Well, yeah, um, of, course, of course. Because they want to make sure everything's working and copacetic before they send it out. And the other thing is, like, if you order from any dealer, um, I don't know if your dealer does this, but, like, you can order the custom colors and all that craziness. Right. Um, I think and, it's the sonic blue thing they do. Yeah. I mean, I, there's probably tax advantages to staying in your state. Because there, oh. I believe Streamwood is oh, yeah. in Illinois, Illinois. Illinois Cook, which means that it's wow. a bit more money for taxes than we're at eight other places. I think we're yeah, they're probably. Seven. I think they're. At, I think they're right around there. But you got to pay shipping too on top of that. So that's true. That's true. So I probably wind up doing it. But the but the beauty is that um, we both got local dealers. I I think I might go in there and see if I can't shoot a video. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoy it. 
I um, so the the California's cool. The Fillmore is cool. Like I don't know which other ones you played, but I, I was played. I played a, a Mark Five. Okay. I played the uh, big guy, the big guy, or the little guy, because they're they're pretty different animals. The little guy. Okay, the twenty five. I had a, I had an opportunity to play a big guy, but I played the the twenty five. So I played the Mark Five twenty five. I played the Fillmore. I played the the uh, new California Tweed, whatever they call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I played the. Uh, there was one in the middle. I care. Triple remember. Crown. Triple Crown. That was not my favorite. I love the Triple Crown. Yeah. I think the Triple Crown is probably the best amp that Mesa has ever built. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a very unique thing because it captures three different eras of Marshall. Um, it and it does them better than Marshall does and probably better than Marshall did originally. Um, I, so here's why I don't think you like the Triple Crown as much. Yeah. The seven string, it handles it so damn well. Yeah. And I've never played like a Marshall style amp that holds up the bass end like that. Um, yeah. And I think it's just the six L sixes or six B sixes or whatever. I think it's six L sixes in it. I um, mean, I've been told you can bias it down to six V sixes to get it down to like 25 Watts. Wow. But yeah. you know this as well as I do, because you've played one. The master volume on those amps is so good. Yeah. Y- you don't yeah. need an attenuator. I mean, no. I know it was incredible. Uh, I, I was, first of all, I was duly impressed with all of them. Um, but of course, I love Mason Boogie. I love, the, I love the sound of a Mason Boogie. Um, and I used a Strat and a Kelly through both of them. Yeah. Um, grabbed a, I grabbed an HSS Strat, similar to the one I have, and a Kelly just like mine on the wall. Played them through there, and it just sounded sweet. It was killer. So you like the, you like the California. What would you think of the Fillmore? I just want to get your gut feel on that. I, I liked it. I mean, it was okay. I, um, the uh, the thing about the Fillmore that um, I liked over the well, the tweed that I liked over the Fillmore was I liked that that voicing that the that the tweed has. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I didn't want to like it. You like the you like the more mids like the more midi feel, right? Because right. because it has it generally. I would say it has more the mid range characteristics, like you're gonna get a Mark Five. Yep. But it's it's got more of the compression and distortion characteristics like you get out of the Fillmore. Right. So it's like the kind of the best of both worlds. And I wonder if the trickery in that amp is really mating some of those principles together, like some of the design philosophies that went into, you know, how they pick the components to get the mids in the Mark V. And yeah. Um, now I liked the Mark V 25. I, really I, I figured you would. Did you the like that crunch five, channel on the clean side? Oh, it was incredible. That's the best part of that amp. Yeah, it was incredible. That now you know why I can't part with it. I, I have one sitting right here next to me right now. I have one near me at all times because they're yeah. just that good. Yeah, um, it's a it's a great amp, great amp. So, so speaking did, of amps, yeah, okay. Speaking of amps, I no Which longer buy? have. Yeah, I no longer have a katana. Again, yeah. <laughs> you're Again. you're betting for three, man. <laughs> I am now playing a Black Star HT forty. Oh, I just uh, played one the other day. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, so with my now I'm I'm just telling you with the first of all the the deal that Guitar Center's got going on right now with them is yeah I saw it and um, I so I pulled out my I let, they let me bring in my um, Telecaster well yeah I bring in my shit there all the time and uh, plugged in and uh, I watched the guy that was playing it and uh, I plugged in and I loved it I mean it, it's <sighs> It's got it's got a lot of the voices that I need. The prop, you know, the, obviously my situation is all of this. Uh, I got to have all that in a bag of chips, right? I just didn't and think it had that much dynamics, to be honest with you. The it's a very I flat had, sending amp. With the the katana wasn't giving me. The katana was losing some stuff that I wanted from um, that I'm getting out of this. It's a pretty flat sounding amp too, and that's what I'm saying. Like they're in the same class for sure. I would look at I would look at a, and and the difference really is that like the the black star has tubes in it, but I I really think they sound super similar to me. Uh, yeah. I do think the black star is a bit chunkier, um, yeah. but I, I could really get some chunk. Out. But it was super dark, yeah. and I, I, it's just not my thing like at all. It it was really dark, and it was it it lacked the dynamic feel of the amps that I'm more in tune with. Um, so well that that's just it. So. 
monetarily, I'm putting money aside to buy the yeah. California food. Yeah, you're going to get California. That, you're going to get California. I saw it, and as soon as I played it, I was like, all right, I got to save for that. So I had to I had to say, okay, let's put some money aside for that. And so this is going to be a stopgap. Yeah, and you're going to trade it. You're going to sell that and off or whatever of again. Get. That because of the deal I got on the guitar center right now, I'll probably only lose about $50 on it. I'm yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I think so. I wonder about that because I think Blackstar is about to come out with the HD40 version three, yeah. which is yeah, why. Is yeah, I. I mean, I played one because I, I. You know, we we talked about it. You bought the uh, the HD5 a while back, yep. or something like that. And uh, I was just in the store, and I was like, I was. I actually went in to try like every amp I could get my hands on, and um, I plugged into that just kind of like getting a feel for things. And, and I, you know, honestly, I think uh, it does a pretty good Marshall impersonation yep. for that amount of money. Um, yep. The ISF control gives you the, is it with yeah, ISF? Marshall, yeah, ISF. Infinite I don't think it's, it's, it's vintage Marshall to modern Marshall. I don't really think it's anything beyond that. They, they make out like, oh, we can go from American to, I'm like, hey, dude, it still sounds like a Marshall. Um, yeah. And, and that's okay. Like, let's be honest. Uh, you know, three quarter of the records that we probably listen to have Marshalls on them. So it's not a big deal. Yep. Um, so what I, what I actually came in to explore was I was looking for, I was looking at cheap high gain stuff. Right. So yeah. I went into the, uh, the platinum room where they kept, they had a bunch of stuff. They, they had a Kemper back there. I didn't get the chance to try it. Um, yeah, I don't think it was hooked up and I wasn't going to dick around. I wasn't going to get the employees to hook it up for me. Um, yeah. I tried, well, I did, I did plug into a Marshall Jam P Mark II. That was pretty cool, but it was super loud um, and just un unruly, like unusable for what I'm trying to do. I plugged into the uh, PV6505 Mini. Um, so right now, like if you've got like 600 bucks to spare and you want to get a high gain amp, now's a good time to be a guitar player because there's several that are really it good is. in that price range. It um, really is. And when I was when when I was like listening to Dream Theater and all this stuff, the, the super high gain guys, like there was nothing like that. There were right. no high gain amps in the in the late '90s that were under a grand. It just yep. didn't exist. Now yep. there's dozens of them. I mean, back then, like it was like get a high rod deluxe and use a metal zone. Like, yeah, get out of your <laughs> That's mind. Exactly right, though. That's exactly right. That's what people were saying. Yeah, it was a hot rod deluxe or a hot rod to bill and get a metal zone. Yeah. Well, so anyway, um, I went back there with the intention of looking at what else they had. So I played that, the, the 6505 mini, we'll get to that in a second. And then I played the, the, um, uh, the MT 15, the PRS Mark Tremonti. The right? Mark Tremonti. The, the yeah. 15 watt. Yep. Wow. Um, yep. so I've kind of been having like these nightmare fantasies about it. Um, yeah. because I'm like, I kind of want one, but, um, there's a lot of overlap between it and my Mark five. At least I yeah. feel there is. Um, and I, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for a good time to get a batch in so I can go in and try it out like ABM through the same cab to see what yep. the differences really are. Um, I, I will say this, like if I, if any amp were going to knock the Katana out of my hands right now, it's probably the MT 15. Yeah. Um, the PD, it's the right price. The PD 6505 mini. I think part of my like bad experience with it in the store was that it was hooked up to the wrong cab. It was like some, Carl something cab. I was a big like orange oh, cab, yeah. but it was a black black cabinet, and it and it sounded very like it was very low endy, but it didn't have a lot of top at all. And for the sixty five hundred five to work, you really got to get some grind going in that top upper mid area. Um, so they also had uh, they had a full size sixty five hundred five, and I played that through. What cab did they have that on top of? Well, this is like a. Oh, it was a, it was a Randall with uh, V30s in it. And um, Randall makes good cabs. Like anybody who says Randall makes crap stuff, like they need to just realize that Randall's a specific thing for a specific type of stuff. Yeah. Um, but, the, but their V30 loaded cabs have always been good. Everyone I've heard has been a great example. Um, and the one I played was no, was no different. And it made that 6505 sound really, really good. The big one. Yeah. Now that wasn't the, the mini head, right? right. So – couple of things I like about the mini head over the, the Mark Tremonti, the mini 6505 goes down to one watt or two Watts. Like it's a real low setting and you can, I mean, you can literally crank it up in your house and it's not going to like your neighbors are not going to flip out. Um, right. Which 
you know, we've talked about this before, but a lot of five watt and one watt amps are like still too loud for like, yeah, yeah. um, and I think, I think it's usable. So the Mark Romani though, on the other hand, like, yeah, I was getting pretty loud in the platinum room with that thing. And, but, but I'm going to buy an attenuator anyway. So maybe it doesn't matter. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm definitely going to get a cabinet. Uh, a, another, I want a two by 12. I'm going to get a two by 12 cause I need something for another head. Like I need to be able to run stereo if I have to. Um, right now I'm like, cool. I honestly Mark five right now. My rig is literally the Katana and four cable with the Mark five. And I, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I even got the channel switching going and everything. So I'm just like, yeah, I don't have time to mess with this stuff anymore. I'll just set up a patch and leave it. Um, so I, I, I think I could get by with, like if I had a two, two, two amp set up or something, like I could do that in, in certain gig situations, but more or less it's just so I have variety. Cause that's one thing I'm noticing. Like now that I got the seven string, I can't really double track because I can only really play the one seven string and then like switch amps. So what I do is I use the helix to do all that. And I got, I got multiple amps going on in uh, helix native in, in the DAW. So I can like, you have a 6505 or a rectifier or a Mark four or Mark four or, um, a Friedman or, you know, like, and just mix and match the combinations I need. Um, yep. but I'm learning a lot right now about metal production and how to, how different it is to rock production, which is like, it's night and day. Um, you know, we've had Steven Miller on the show multiple times before. Yeah. Um, and I have to say like my hat's off to him because his records sound great. And oh, it yeah. is not, it is like walking on the moon in terms of how you create the production stuff outside of like regular electric guitar amp thing like if you're gonna do a rock record you come in the guitar player plays the drummer plays the bass player plays and then you kind of mix so that they don't step on each other's toes when you do when you do a metal record everybody has to be so in sync and it's not just that like that's only part of it the other thing is literally you take the guitars and you shove everything be like below like 300 hertz there's no low end in the guitars and so the, the, the bass takes it over and then you just, you know, you have this grindy bass going on and it has to be perfectly in sync because if it's not, then they sound like a separate instrument and your guitar right. sound thin as hell. But if it's, but if it's working, that's how you get Ola England. Like I was listening that's, to some, yeah. um, he did a, he did a video uh, several years ago, probably 2016 or 2015 or something where he did a comparison of like common High, high gain amps that people look at like and compare them all and there's like 15 in the video you know you had like a like the um using kind of triamp and all that stuff in there and what he was doing was he was showing like what these amps sound like in an actual metal production so you know he'd have like drums and bass and all that and it was funny because i was listening to it like really critically um normally i would just have this on and i wouldn't pay attention to it but then i started realizing like there's no low end in these guitars at all I mean, there's a little bit, but like it's mostly bass, and you realize suddenly like the bass is more, way more critical in metal music today. And that's not to say like in the '70s and '80s it wasn't different, but like today the bass is the the predominant instrument. I'd say it's the glue that holds everything together. And if you don't do it right, your record's going to sound like trash. Now, yep. here's the fun part, though, right? So that's modern metal. If you go back to like the seventies and eighties, really the late eighties, even thrash metal, you can get away with a bass part that doesn't double the guitar. So it's more or less like got riffs and stuff going on. Whereas mm-hmm. in modern metal, it's a lot of times, I would say probably 80% of the time it's doubling what the guitar is doing, um, which is cool. Like I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I think obviously it fits. I mean, you listen to those tones and you're like, that's the only way you could achieve that. Um, right. So it just makes it funnier, though, to me that people are just getting lower and lower with guitars because the bass is really providing all the heaviness. So going lower than a seven string is just not in the cards. For one thing, my fingers, they're not long enough for that. My hands aren't big enough. Um, Mm -hmm. But the other reason is because, um, number one, your strings. So I'm playing a seven string, right? Take a guess. Well, you probably know because you've played seven strings before. Take a guess what the difference in price between a six string set and a seven string set is. Uh, $3. Go higher. No way. Dude, $7? It's, it's no, it's between five and $10 more 
for a seven Jeez, string set. Uh, they have really jacked the prices. I, so Einway XLs, right? What are they? They're like eleven bucks. Twelve ninety nine. Twelve ninety nine. Mm-hmm. A set of seven string NYXLs the other day cost me seventeen dollars. Jeez. Say that's a five dollar difference. Yeah, or, dude. Or Jeez. So the price difference. As it is, we're both using freaking expensive strings. Well, and, yeah, and the thing is, like, I can use NYXLs or I can use elixirs, and they're the same price. Yeah. Isn't it nuts? I mean, yeah. NYXLs don't have a coating on them. So I, I, I don't understand it. I um, don't make strings, so I don't get it. Maybe we can get a string maker to tell us why that is. So opti- So uh, that's another thing. We can, we can talk about that real quick. So while we're talking about gear on the show. I've been experimenting with different string brands because I've been using NYXL um, for, you know, last three years, four years or whatever, since I came out pretty much. Um, and now I'm using, uh, I'm using, uh, well, I'm going to be switching to NYXLs on the, on the Kiesel, but I got two sets of elixirs through my fingers. Um, and then I had a, I had a set of Dunlops. We'll talk about that too. Um, <laughs> Jim knows, Jim knows we had this conversation already. Um, so the the elixirs are great. I mean, honestly, they've come a long way from when I used them 15 years ago or something when they first started to make an appearance. Uh yeah, the po- say, what's the original coding like polyweb is what they call yes, it or whatever. Polyweb nanoweb. So they have well, now nanoweb. polyweb. No. Yeah. They have nanoweb and then they have optiweb. Optiweb. That's now, I bought nanowebs, right? So I bought a set of 10 to 59 nanowebs. And yeah. and so and that's another thing too. Apparently, Kiesel uses strings that Elixir doesn't make. So they're like, we make, we, we have 10 to 50, our, t- our sets are 10 to 60 or whatever on, the, on their right. site. Yeah. There is no 60 from them. They don't make a 60, right? The heaviest string they make for seven strings is a uh, 59. What? You can get a 10 to 59 set from Elixir. So you can't buy individuals from Elixir. That's another, that's another fun thing. Um, so sounds to me like string joy is going to get a call from you. <laughs> well, it was, but if I'm going to do it, I might as well get coded. Right. Like that's, I, w- I wanted yeah. to be just like the ones that came on it. What I liked about the elixirs is they felt really good. What I don't like about the elixirs is that they snow. And I know. Oh, even the, God. so oh, God. years and years ago when I had the, um, have a dark color guitar, that shit. Oh. Well, you know what color my guitar is, you know, yes, um, yes. the poly, the pot or so the poly web, right. Well, the the white. <laughs> The Polyweb original stuff was like, it would flake off in giant chunks. And then the Nanoweb doesn't do that. It looks like pick dust. The Polyweb would, uh, so I, I, I'm going to tell you, I don't know if I've told this story before. I, I oh, wait, wait, you, could, first, you could literally peel it off. That's how bad yeah, it was. I was one of the first users. What happened was. Yeah, because you um, were in the, the beta group, right? Right. So it, um, beta male elixir. Yeah. Elixir <laughs> set out this thing. Hey, anybody want to be in the beta group? And they just took, I'm sure they just took the first, however many that apply. Sure. So I wound up with a box of elixirs. So myself and a friend who he was changing strings all the time because he, um, he's passed away since then. Um, but he, he had these really, his hands would just, this acidic, yeah, they were, um, they were acidic. Right. And, uh, so he was always changing. Strings. So I said, all right, why don't you take half the box? I'll take half the box. We'll write a review. And that's what I did. I wrote a review. They sent me, they, they, even though I trashed them, they sent me this, all the stuff, sent me mugs, and stickers, and, and a t-shirt, all kinds of shit. Well, they're just thanking you for your service. Oh, yeah. They thanked me for what I did. And, and I wasn't, I didn't go, you suck, and this is their, I just went, uh, I would make some recommendations. It literally, I would, we both played pretty heavy picks, pretty Strong. Yeah. Oh, that that's another that's another development in my thing. We'll talk about that too. So, as we're playing, the plastic peeled right off. Oh yeah. And, and I was looking at bare string after a gig. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, what's the point? Of this? And it looked like it, it looked like a snake that was molting. Mm-hmm. It was just, and his fingers wore the the webbing or the the poly right off the frets. And so what we both were looking at was we had plastic shavings all over our legs. We were both sitting. And it's just, I, I said, God, I don't know. And no. it's been a long time. So it, it would be, it would be, I would be hard pressed to go from an NYXL, which you can see several packs right there. Yeah. One hand. Or even Ernie Ball hybrid 
Twinkies to that. Okay, so here's here's where I'm gonna change my tune, route, right? So like Polywebs sucked. I didn't like them. Nano webs, I've had a set of those on my guitar now. They did start shedding eventually. They're not as bad as the polywebs were 10, 15 years ago when I tried them. Um okay. the optiwebs are probably what came on my guitar. Okay. Okay. And they are exceptional. Problem okay. is, I can't get them anywhere. I went to go uh, order the Sweetwater and they're out of stock. So I'm like, really? what the hell? Well, seven string, ten to fifty nine set. Oh yeah, that's true. So and seven um, strings are starting to hit a popular the, the curve is starting to Yeah, I think it's kind of turning down. I think honestly people like really went for like the seven strings. Now that the eight strings are out there, if you're into like that kind of stuff, most of the guys are moving to eight. Really? Um and I, I think I just don't see that many production eights. I mean well, they're out there. Oh Nobody's no, they're there. out there. And and there there are only like eight of them and everybody's buying those. Well, see, here's the deal. It's not it's not that everybody's buying it, Jim. You know what it is? It's the people that play seven strings. Many of them are more adventurous and willing to go to eight. So what did you do? You leveled the playing field. That's right. So all of a sudden you got half those people are moving into eights. Now you have half the amount of seven string players yep. or, you know, and I'm, I'm sure that some of them also have seven string guitars too, but like they may not use them as frequently. And that may be a big part of that. Um, but I can totally see there's going to be a revival in m more stringed instruments, whether it be something like a six with, you know, doubled four. Or something like that, you know, that where where your e, uh, EBG and D strings are doubled. Or, you know, there's been stuff like that in the past. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody else does it. Um, yeah, yeah. But I digress. So I I, I think the OptiWebs are worth looking at um, because the the coating is so much thinner on the OptiWebs. It yeah. does flake eventually, but it took almost a week. And yeah. when it finally did, and I, man, I was playing that guitar every day, like two and a half hours a day. And when it, when it, or two, probably more than that, to be honest with you. And uh, it flaked, but like, and you could see where it worn off the strings, but it wasn't like it, it wasn't like make it rain or anything like that. It was, right. um, it was pretty reasonable. I could deal with it. No worse than pick dust, right? right. Um, like exactly. a small amount of pick dust. Now, that's another thing on, on my front here. And, and that, this has been going on since prior to my leaving for Texas. And I don't know if I've said anything on the show, but I may have already. Um, so I've been investigating new picks, right? And, I, and I've decided on a set of, uh, set of picks I like. Um, the funny thing is, I, my V-picks, right? Like, the yep. first couple I had, it took a while to wear them out. The, the last set I got, I think he just changes materials a lot, Vinny over a V-pick, because these have worn down, like, unbelievably fast. I bought, and they're not cheap. They're five bucks a piece, and I got them on yeah. sale for, like, three bucks a piece, and I bought... I bought like 24 yeah. probably in November and I have like maybe six or eight that are playable now. Um, nice. And I don't know, I think I bought, I probably didn't buy 24. I bought, I bought quite a few though. I bought like $50 worth. It was, I remember going, just groaning and being like, I just spent $50 on picks. Like, what am I thinking? Um, so I've kind of been on the hunt and you turned huh. me onto the flow picks, right? Yep. Um, so I got the flow variety pack and, uh, I really liked them. Um, I, there, there was a bunch of different shapes. There was a couple different thicknesses I actually liked, which I only have one now that I'm using, but I, but I'm going to get some of the other thicknesses when I come across them, um, in, in packs, just so I have them around for like doing certain things. But, mm -hmm. uh, what I, what I've settled on is my main pick right now is a Dunlop flow, um, jumbo that they're green. They're kind of translucent. Um, it's got a bit of a point on it. It's not super pointy, um, but I but these wear super well. I've been yeah. I've been using one specific pick for like three weeks, yeah. and I've got. I mean, there's a you can see a little mark where it started to wear in it. Yeah. But um, I bought a set. I bought a bag. I could get those a bag for like eleven bucks with like twenty four of them or something. It's seventeen or twenty four minute. Wow. Um, what is it? I've got, one, I got the bag right here. So, yeah, I can actually afford to buy picks again. Oh, um, nice. What are these? Uh, 12 count. And I think this is 12 bucks. So, dollar yep. pick. Which, that's not cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than what I was paying. Um, and these seem to hold up pretty well, uh, like I said. And 
they're just the right shape and stuff. So I'm I'm really happy right now. Um, plus the texturing's nice. That's another thing. V pick. Oh, our plastic when it warms up, it sticks to your fingers. Liars, liars. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter whether the plastic is warm or cold. It it, it has an oily feel to it. Yeah. But it does not stick to your fingers. Okay. <laughs> No one who's used them that I've talked to claims that that is a thing. So I don't know where they're getting this whole thing from. They do mm-hmm. have um their logo is raised, but it's not enough to be grippy. Like it's not gonna it's not gonna hold on to your these are the little dots. It's almost yep. like serrations from a knife, which is what I would usually do. Um, so the pick would stay in my hand. Right. Um, but I've gotten a lot better about that too. Like I I haven't dropped a pick in months when I'm playing. Um, yeah. So. I haven't either. The only time I ever drop a pick is when I'm putting it down. When you're putting it down? Yeah, like I put you're it down. It? No, I, I go, <laughs> bad pick. You, you're an ugly pick. No, when I like go to put it down. I thought um, maybe you blame the pick for when you can't play properly. I don't know. <laughs> Let me tell you, it is the pick's fault. We, uh, Jeff and I have been going back and forth while the show's going on right now. And uh, he, he sent me a message a few minutes ago. And we were talking about some, some playing that was going on. And I mentioned yeah. to him that I like really flubbed up the uh, – double guitar harmony from um uh whipping post and like i was like i don't even think anybody will know that it was whipping post the way i did it and he's like he's like i didn't even hear you play it and i'm like yeah exactly and he's like well he's like i haven't played in three days so you know we all have excuses or whatever and i'm thinking like yeah everybody comes up with an excuse for when they like when they have to play in front of people and yeah you know what here here's an interesting thought when you play in front of people right yeah if you're a singer and you sing a cappella, so it's just you and you're carrying everything. Right. Everybody knows that's like really high art, like high talent. They get a lot of respect for doing that. Absolutely. When you're a guitar player and you're playing by yourself and you sound like crap, no one cares. No they one so, They're like, you suck. Like, <laughs> matter of fact, here's the thing that most people, I mean, and I'm the, probably the worst of my own critics, right? And yet, I will. I have people come up to me and oh, that sounded so good. It was so spot on. You really nailed that. That was really good. And people that they don't know me, they don't care yeah. about. Me. Yeah. Like, I love your play. You're so skilled. You so. And I go. I sucked. That was awful. What were you hearing? I that's what, yeah, but that's one thing. Like if you listen to back a recording and you know it was bad, like oh, then you're yeah. like, oh my god. <laughs> you guys are tone deaf. Yeah. <laughs> What yeah. is wrong with you people? <laughs> so I've been debating. Like I've got all these old uh, VHS tapes of me playing uh, in my in my high school band, which was Lucid Vision. For anybody who's a long time listener of the show, and uh, I got these VHS tapes. I haven't watched them in like ten years. I've been thinking right. about maybe I should put them in. I got a I got a you know VHS to DVD thing. Yep. Maybe I should uh, maybe I should run them through there. <laughs> you should. I should because I want to preserve the the tapes for my kids. But like. You know, I'm amazed, even in um, so uh, I'm going to come out of, uh, come across as a douche, but hey, it won't be the first time. <laughs> You're right on that one. <laughs> I am, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I am amazed. You you see the um, uh, sometimes I'm looking this way because I'm looking trying to point <laughs> my face at the microphone. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. But anyway, I, I'm I'm amazed sometimes at how there are, people will put these videos of themselves playing guitar on online we've talked and about they get, this they get these like people are like oh my god it's so good it's so awesome it's so you are so incredible and then at first i'm like okay th- they must have heard something i didn't hear <laughs> I, back, I almost sent you one today i was like am i am i hearing things because uh, i hear somebody that doesn't know what chord progression is you know, right yeah so, and so i'm going all right i i I got to listen back and I listened back and I went, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. I then, this is the response I did. This is how bad I was today. I don't know if anybody's done ever, ever yeah. done anything like that. Yeah. Send your hate uh, mail to uh, Jim Woodard. No, no. <laughs> I sat down and I plugged in. Actually, I did this yesterday because I picked the um, black star up afterwards. I plugged in the, the katana, the, the direct. By the way, the Black Star has a great has DIN quarter inch and USB out. But anyway, I plugged it in to uh, uh, my my focus right. I sat in front of a camera and I did a video and I said, 
this is what you should do. And I played to, I never do this. I never, people, I never play to jam tracks. I not. A, a <laughs> you have, I have seen it. <laughs> I, know, I know. It's not what, it's not something I typically do. I don't no, right, 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 right. jam tracks. I play to music that, that has vocals and, and I fit in between. Well, anyway, I sat down and I did a, a 30 minute video of instruction. This is the key. This is what Aeolian oh means. Oh my this, God. And I sent it to the person. I pro, it's private. You cannot see it uh-huh. on my channel. It's unlisted, but I can't give you the link. <laughs> and I'm sitting in this chair and, and you can't, you can hear it, but you can't see it. There's a there's an armrest right here. It can't hit my forearm when I try to That's a it. DX racer chair, right? Yeah, it's one of those. Are, those, are those arms removable? Yeah, I gotta take the arm off. No, I'm, it, I'm asking because I'm thinking about getting one. one. <laughs> yeah, the other one fell off. You have to put them on. So here's what I thought. Show. Don't put them on. So anyway, because um, it was it was bumping my left arm. There was a few sour notes in there. I was like, all right, well, it bumped my. And I and I said, look, I I know this sounds like sun was in my eyes, but I, I was bumping my arm. Anyway, I went through it. The guy goes, "You should do an instructional video. That was so good. You 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 pointed everything out. The guy took oh, it. Dude, you meant." He said, he said, dude, you showed me the dynamics. You showed me the range. You showed you played it all the way across the fretboard from the open to the to the all to the end. You played you played on the neck pickup, but you didn't say this is the neck pickup, this is the bridge pickup, the little pickup. You just, just I just played it. I said, now see, I'm gonna roll back and I did I'm gonna roll back on the volume. Now I'm gonna do this. Now I'm gonna dig it a little a little with the pick and then come back on it. And then I'm gonna use some finger style and I'll show you, you know, but I was doing it as I was playing. And so the guy said, that is so informative. He said, he said, nobody's ever shown me how to play over a chord progression because everybody says, this is a, say play over a, but he yeah. goes, the he whole, goes, the, like the progression is in the key of, and then you use the like, right. pentatonic minor. Like that's so not, okay. but right. That but, works, but, and I said to him, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And you and I both know that. Yeah. Said, that's why I'm like, Try that with jazz, see how that goes for you. That's exactly what I was about to say. This particular one was in jazz, so it had this this diminished chord. It was all two five one, and then there's like a diminished in there somewhere, and like it was it was a diminished chord. All the modes, and so every time I heard that diminished chord come in, of course he's playing A minor pentatonic over, I'm like, or no D minor pentatonic, and I'm like, ow, 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 and I showed him. I said, look, when that happens, you have to realize that this is where you're going, and I showed him, and I said. Here's how the chord is. So what I did was I took the chord. And I said, here's the chord. This is what they're doing to get there. And I said, so this is how it fits in there. So this is why these notes, which you would typically use in that key, don't work over that chord because that is a passing tone. But if you target a time and hit your, your note there, you're going to clang against that chord, and it's going to go, Wah! and it's going to sound out of tune, and it's going to sound completely wrong. So I have so- couple yeah. things to share about this first off jim you are really good at explaining music like yeah. when you sit down and you talk about and you've done it on the show before and, and our listeners have responded to it but when you talk about like um what i think we talked about my sharon a couple times on the show before like yeah. you broke it down and you had all the theory and like you understand the piece way better than most people do i mean i, I, I there are pieces of music i can play that i don't necessarily understand exactly what's going on in them um, right. but, I, but I sort of understand, like you have to have a working knowledge, but for you, because it's so much about memory, if you don't understand it, there's no way you're going to remember it. Exactly. Cause I cannot, anybody that thinks that I go on stage and memorize everything I play, they, 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 they are sadly mistaken. And I am the first person to tell you, I don't bring sheet music. I believe in it for other people and other situations, but for a rock band in a club. Yeah, it's never supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be improvisational in a lot of that's ways. That's right. And you've got to, so what I do is I remember what it sounds like. Yeah. And if I can remember what it sounds like, I can remember how to play it. And it doesn't mean that I'll get it exact every time. You can get close but, enough. Like I can play the solo from time that way. That's like right. if I'm playing along with it, I know what the big bend is, you know, on the G yep. string and like the rest of it, I can just figure out as I go. Because it's, it's exactly. a song, it's solo you can sing, you know? And I've had people come up to me and go, man, you played that solo exact. And I'm like, no, I didn't. No, not even <laughs> close. Not even close. Like, but yeah, it's a, bad, I was in a different position. And <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I was completely Maybe you didn't wrong. notice, but I was playing in Lydian, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, uh, it, that was in Mixolydian, and I was in Locrian. But anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, like one, it's only one <laughs> scalar degree away. Who cares? <laughs> exactly. But it was just funny to, to um, uh, hear, you know, the, the guy take it the way that I meant it to be. And that was, because I didn't come across like, you know what, you suck. And you should do it like this. I didn't come across it. I was like, yeah, let yeah, me yeah. just give you some suggestions. And, and you know what? Honestly, that's the best way to handle it, though. Like when you see people that are stumbling through something like that, don't right. let them stumble. Like give them a hand. Don't right. don't be the old school like guitar sensei that we've talked about on the show before. Who's like yep. who's like to go to go fast. You must first go slow. Like don't do that. <laughs> Explain it to them. Uh, right. Try to make it achievable for them. And I, Jim, you've done that a couple of times. Like you said, um, there was a novel that you posted in the group where you were like <laughs> explaining to somebody about, about something like some really simple song. It was, it was, a, it, it was like, down. yeah, it was a one, four, five progression. What was it? Um, I want to say it was Tom Petty. And I, yeah, and it I was something this, like that. This like 350 page essay or five, five or a thousand word essay that was like, okay, this is why and I was surprised Facebook let me post it. Because they do have a maximum. It was I've never so hit the maximum, dude, and I've posted some novels, let me tell you. <laughs> and I went, ooh. But, you know, and um, my, my thing is this. I, you know, I know those of you who know me know I know theory, right? I mean, I... Well I'm, enough. Like, you know, well enough. you know rock theory, which is like, right. like you get into start the, some of the crazy jazz stuff. I don't know yeah. that you would necessarily get all that. But no, you know if you, enough about theory to, like, put together your basic pop and rock music. Right. I know harmony and I know, you know, and I know melody and I know the, the theory that goes behind it. Now, if you asked me to break down Zappa's. You yeah, know, exactly. Zappa album, <laughs> I would be. In the hey, can, we talk, can we talk about, uh, can you write me a fugue, Jim? Can yeah, you? exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. <laughs> this is some counterpoint here. <laughs> First, I'd have to, uh, I'd have to see what that is. No, I don't. Know what <laughs> but I, I would not be able to do it. That's and, and knowing this is a thing that people don't get about theory. And I want to, I want to make this clear. I've, I've tried to say this in a hundred groups. You, you didn't, you didn't wait until you knew the entire English language to begin writing paper. Right? Absolutely. You didn't wait. You don't know everything about the English language now. I know I don't. Oh, I, know, I sure don't. And I was an English major. <laughs> see, the that's exactly. And I was about to make this point and, and tell me if I'm wrong. The more, you know, the more, you know, you don't know. Yes, exactly. It, it, it's um, so there's a let's get philosophical for a minute. So the you know yeah. epistemology, right? Which right. Is the study of what you can know, right? Like Correct. study of knowledge, basically. And yeah. the the thing with epistemology is that um, pretty early on, people realized like the amount of material that we could possibly know is like a pinhead on something the size of a football field. Right. I mean, it, it's. It, there's just so much stuff like omnipotence. This idea that you can know everything about something is just, it's, it's unfathomable. You can't, it's total crap. you can't total crap. And so that's, that's what, what I try to explain every time I go into a group that talks about theory and they go, well, I shouldn't have to know theory or I should, you know, and I'm like, look, you only need to know the amount of theory you need to be able to do what you do. You didn't learn. You don't learn how to build or, I mean, I'm sorry the engineering behind every car before you've changed your oil. That's right. And so if all you're ever going to do is change your own oil, you don't need to know everything about your car. And that's, that's what I kind of break it down to. I take it to every, you know, I, I have a ton of analogies. I, I really intend on writing a Zen guitar book. I but, dude, dude, I'm, I'm telling you right now, if you put together some lesson material like that, I don't care what quality is. If, if you do it well, like, in other words, you explain it well, put it up on our YouTube channel. People will yeah. go nuts for it because that's what people want. Like, yeah. when I've, uh, there's a couple of YouTube channels I, I've learned music from, like, like different songs and whatever. Um, and the ones that explain why are the ones right. that are best. Like, so for, like, Andy Aladort, when he yeah. does his Hendrix stuff, like he did the, the Hendrix Guitar World DVDs, they're so oh. good because Come oftentimes on. he'll tell you, Hendrix was just noodling here. Like, you don't really have to play it exactly like he did. You just got to, like, know what he was doing. Exactly. And, and he's so right about it. Yeah. He, he's like, okay, you, you, you want to be in left field for this one, but you need to be in center field for this one. 
you know, and, and he knows exactly what, what was going on. It is amazing that Andy Aldor wasn't like a close personal friend of Hendrix. But, yeah. but he, could, he, he could read him through his music, though. That's the thing. Right. But he is a personal friend of like Dickie Bats and those guys. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. He knew a lot of those dudes. Yeah. Um, Jim, Jim um, I mean, I, I, your personal, your gut take on it. So, like, you've heard me play the Hendrix stuff. Like, I get yeah. it. So when yeah, I hear him yeah. explaining it and yeah. like, and it clicks in my head, like this is exactly the way I had perceived it too. I, it resonates with me and it's going to resonate yeah. with our audience too. And that's, yeah, I think, yeah, I think he's one of the best, you know, there's, there's very few people that, I mean, first of all, and, and I would never say I'm as good a player as any of these people, but Greg Cock. <laughs> we just talked uh, about him today at good time. I was, so Anderson and Squatch. Talking, yeah, man, Squatch. Uh, he he put up the um, Anderson's put up a new video with him because he went there and did a. Clinic. I saw that. Yeah. Oh my God! What a great video, people! If you haven't seen that, yeah. Um, I'll look into the group. Really super, super enlightening. Video. First of all, he's such. He's so funny. He's probably the most entertaining person I've ever seen, and uh, he. But the the way again, he goes through. It's not like well, these are my secret pickups, and I'll never tell you anything about it. This is my secret amplifier, and I'll never tell you anything about it. No way. He, no, he doesn't he's care like, at all. Off. It's like this. It's just this. And, and, he's, and you can tell. I can finally tell about how tall Anderton is, Lee Anderton, because <laughs> sitting next to Cock, I'm like, oh, yeah, Anderton's not much taller than I am. <laughs> all right. Can we, can we talk for a second? Yeah. I, just, I just went to the Gear Fest site. Yeah. See who's going to be presenting this year. With. Let me go through. Let me go through the list with you. Ooh, and there's one that I'm literally, I dude. I just, I, I'm gonna have to go change my underwear because I think I just pooped my pants. Okay, go ahead. Um, Billy Sheehan's gonna be there. <gasps> Craig Anderton. Oh, uh-huh. um, I'm just, I, you know, I'll just read them all. Bill Evans, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Daniel Fisher, who's a who's a th- yeah. synth player. Yeah. Uh, Danny Korchmar, who's a guitar player, producer, songwriter. Uh, David Pensado, producer, engineer. Dennis mm-hmm. Chambers, a drummer. Uh, mm-hmm. Fab Dupont was a producer mixer. Greg yeah. Cock is going to be there again, um, and you know he will be. You know he will be there promoting Fishman. So I am so happy about that. Let's talk to him at the Fishman booth. Um, yeah. Jack Ward King, producer engineer. Jeff Baxter. <gasps> Baxter will be there. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, Johnny A will be there. Kenny yeah. Greenberg will be there. Orianthi will be there. Oh God. Randall so Randall sweet. Smith will be there of Mesa Boogie. And he's listed as a guitarist. So I don't know whether he's like promoting his product or if he's going to be presenting or playing. Okay. Wow. Ricky Skaggs. <gasps> Rudy Sarzo. Oh my God. I'm saving the best for last. I'm already pissing my pants right now. Sylvia Massey. Tim no. Pierce. Oh God. Tor Morganson. Yeah. From, from uh, uh, TC Electronics, right? Yeah. Uh, fame. He's not with them anymore. Travis Larson, yeah, and Steve Vai. <gasps> oh my God! Yes, Holy Steve Vai will be at Gear Fest this year, folks. They just made this whole trip worthwhile. This oh yeah, so worthwhile now. I it's like going to Disney World though. I won't ever get a chance to meet all of them. Oh yeah, you will meet as well. You'll be there for two days, my friend. You will uh, get a chance to meet anybody that you walk around with. Oh, I'm getting there early. Well, you know, the only one you probably won't meet is, uh, and by the way, they have a picture of Paul Reed Smith at the top. Um, the yeah, only sure one you will probably not meet out of the out of this group is Steve Vai because he'll probably be shuffled around backstage and all that kind of thing. Because they don't like some of the people are. If you're if they're bigger, you're probably not going to see him over. He might be though because he's I, the kind of guy that would be hanging out at the at the Ibanez booth or whatever. Well, I, yeah, I'll do my best. So Randall Smith, like I'm looking forward to that being able to have, oh, Randall have Smith. a conversation with the man himself wow Um, that is an incredible i i didn't know they posted that yet that's yeah they just posted it at the other day i didn't i haven't looked at it yet greg cock i'm happy to say i'm happy to be able to to uh, have a conversation with him this time i just need to get you a picture of me with greg cock so we can see the height difference (laughs) oh yeah so you can look like uh like like uh like like, like, uh, i don't want to say that that's a terrible word uh i want to say like like uh, like like like, like in the uh game of thrones sense you know yeah (laughs) Uh, I'll, be, I'll be over there. I drink and I know things. <laughs> yeah. 
You probably will. <laughs> <laughs> I have to have a beer in my hand. I drink it. I know things. Yeah. So, so um, exciting. Exciting. Uh, well, anyway, he, um, you mentioned another person in there, Tim Pierce, another guy that when he, he does this stuff and explains it, um, Phil X used to be like that when he was still doing that kind of thing. Um, and of course, Justin Guitar. I think that's pretty much. Well, I think Tim Pierce it. will be there for, for uh, um, Rivera because. Or PRS. I have been He's hearing PRS. rumblings that Rivera has either a new amp or a new line of amps coming, and they're supposed to be very, very cool. So, really? Yeah. I, I, this is what I've heard. It didn't come from Good Time. So if you're wondering if I heard it from them, I did not hear it from them. I heard it from somebody else through the grapevine. So, um, oh. that, so, they, right, so they haven't had a whole lot coming out in the last like no. five, six years. And mm -hmm. I've been wondering what they're doing. And I have a feeling they've been spending some hardcore development time to revamp their amp line. Because um, basically all of the Riveras are very similar. They have a different preamp sometimes, but the yeah. power amp stages are like carried over from another amp. And they really only have like two amps they're selling and they're just kind of like tweaking things here and there. Now, I know Tim is also a, a PRS. Um, yeah, he's a PRS guy and he's, he's pictured here with PRS. So, um, yeah. yeah, but I'm, dude, I'm stoked now. Like, I'm ready. When's Gear Fest? June 22nd, 23rd. I know, right? I, I, I keep coming up, man. When am I going? When am I going? When am I going? Yeah, it's coming up, man. So, uh, yeah, the, Rush, the Rock Crusher series was the last uh, the last thing that they did, right? Yeah. And well, I'm guessing if Steve Vai is going to be there, he's going to be the. Uh, so he's running something called the Tools and Tone and the Tone, which is one of the um, one of the clinics. Yep. But I'm going to guess that he will be the headliner performer, too. Yeah. So, I'm, oh, by the way, in September, I'm going to see Dweezil. So Are you? He's performing at Arcata, so I am going to buy tickets, and I am going to go. So, all right. So we've talked about this before, um, jumping on to that now, moving along from, from mm -hmm. less and stuff to this. Um, so the, the, the Zappa hologram tour is in full swing. Yeah, I didn't know they actually ended up doing it. Um, what's his name? Uh, the the guitologist um, who I didn't watch the video, but he's got a video <laughs> where he's talking about getting tickets. So it's it's in full swing. Yeah. So February eleventh, twenty nineteen, they were gonna. They, there's a. So it's gonna start April nineteenth. So it's already started as of like a yeah. week ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't please please if you're listening to our show, I implore you, don't go see that. There's there's two reasons. It's not just the hologram. You know what? If Dweezil was doing a hologram thing. I, I'd still go. It's but not. You know, I, you know, it's not that Frank would be furious. That's, that's what I was about to say. It's the morals of it. It's the children that are in charge of it. Um, you know, his children um, that are in charge of it. They they screwed the other two kids over, and then the mom. You know, we've talked about this. Well, on it's the show. because the Frank Zappa yeah. family estate had had run itself into the ground under under Gale, and yeah. so then now. Now they left Amit and, and his sister to try and pick up the pieces. That's right. In which case they might be fear facing debt because they're an owner in that corporation. That's right. So they're like they're like, we have no choice. I have to do this. Dweezel can't use his own last name for um promotional purposes. No, he has to attach his first name to it as well. He has to have his first name in there. <laughs> and that is that is completely wrong. And that is what I'm talking about. They have so made Zappa it. plays whatever the f he wants. <laughs> well, he'll play whatever he wants. <coughs> but I'm just saying that he can't call it. Remember the Zappa plays Zappa tour, which was great, <coughs> by the way. That was the name of the tour following that. Was the Dweezil Zappa plays whatever the f he wants tour? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, dude, I, I have to be honest with you. Like, I've seen some great shows in the last two years. But that's the one I'm waiting for because I know that one's going to be unbelievable. Um, and anything Dweezil and his dad were attached to, it tends yep. to be really, really good. Um, yep. I hope we said this on the show before. I really hope him and Amit could bury the hatchet because I would. Yeah. I I think I think Frank would be furious about the hologram show, and I think he'd be more furious as his kids are fighting. Yep. Um, and the way they're fighting. Yep. Like Frank was not. He was not a vindictive person. No. Um, he, you know, he would he would tell you. Like you read interviews and stuff, he'd tell you if he didn't like you, but he wasn't yeah. going to be like walking around talking about how awful a person you are, or you know, <laughs> he's not twisting the knife to make any deeper. He'd just say, "I don't like you," and that's yeah. it. 
and move on. Yeah. So exactly. he did have some feuds though. Like he had the one with uh, what uh, John Lennon. Yeah. That the, yeah. the Yoko Ono and John Lennon played with him and. Yeah, and there was a big contract dispute. You can read all about that one because that oh, that's man. legendary. But um, yeah. So and he and he was skilled at business. So on top of that, he navigated the music industry by being able to say, like, music is a performance art. I don't want anybody to perform my music except for myself, unless they paid me the royalty, you know, the necessary royalties. But I would rather have my music performed by actual individuals. Yep. Than to you know have somebody go and watch me playing at a recording. Even yeah. and that that was about the time of Baby Snakes, um, so oh, yeah, yeah. he understood like I'm selling something that really isn't a live performance. But he also said that it is a it is a um, like a a cardboard cutout stand stand in for the fact that not everybody can go see him, right? Mm -hmm. Like can't go. So he was kind of basically saying, "Look, this exists for the people that like don't I don't visit their town." You know, or whatever, and right. and for posterity. So don't don't go see the Zappa hologram tour. Go rent two hundred motels, baby snakes. Get them on Netflix or whatever. Yep, and watch those because right. that's really that that was art to him, right? Yep. But not yep. not some. And believe it or not, I think that they're using actor. parts of that. That's just it. Oh, I'm sure they are because it's they got to get the video footage to make the hologram from somewhere. Yep. You know, and he was not exactly videoed every five seconds of his life. I mean, he was, no. uh, he was a very private individual, actually. He was. Which it was funny. I mean, you, you look back at some of the interviews, like he was on The Tonight Show. Yeah, you were, would never think he was a private dude, but he is. <laughs> he was. It, it, um, like I said, if, if you're a true fan, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. But I would, <clears throat> before I went and saw a hologram of him, I'd either try to catch Dweezil or I would. I would uh, watch Baby Snakes. Or hey, to be honest with you, Dweezil looks more and more like his dad every day. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. I, I'm just waiting for him to grow the uh, the goatee. Yep. And then he will look <laughs> just like Frank. And then they will sue him for using Frank's likeness. Yep. That's because my understanding is the, the goatee thing that Frank had is actually copyrighted. Oh, my um, God. In, in images. So if he were to do that, that would be the ultimate, like, let's see if I get sued now. Oh, I should no. probably write him a letter because I think he would probably do it just for that. You think? Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, his, Abed and what's his, his little sister's name? So, Not who you that she's the older one. Um, uh, Diva. It's Diva. Amit and Diva, Dweezil and Moon. And the funny thing is that Dweezil, that was not his name he was born with. Like they made it, they would not put his, because Frank was going to name him that. They would not put it on his birth certificate. Yeah. So, then what they did was that like when Dweezil came of age and he realized that he wanted to have his name changed. Yep. So he went to the thing and got his name changed. Yeah. His, um, I remember when moon unit was named moon unit Zappa. Yeah. Her, her middle name is unit. Yeah. <laughs> Which moon is, unit. I think that was another, uh, Frank Zappa middle finger. Authority. Middle finger like, society. <laughs> and you know, the funny part is none of these kids have changed their names. No, like they they wear it like a badge of honor. Yeah, um, oh yeah, Moon Unit could have easily changed your name to Cheryl or something. But yeah, yeah. Well, and then of course Diva. That that's really funny to me. Diva Zappa, because you know she's Zappa. acting like one right now. Um. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if, anyway. You, if you haven't watched where we've talked about this before on this show, just Google yeah. what's going on between Dweezil and the Zappa yeah. estate, and yeah. you'll see. Yeah, <laughs> it's too bad. It's, it's terrible. Too, it was. When families take sides and, and a parent um, who has control, um, mental control over, you know, part of the family and starts to pull them in a direction, it's it's just, it's sad. That's how it is. It sure um, is. So anyway, so <clears throat> um, moving right along uh, uh, with guitar stuff. So, yeah, I I think it would be uh, one of the things, like I said, that, that I – think that has been missing from a lot of online um, instruction. And I think it's because the instructors themselves aren't really schooled um, is that it's missing. Like everybody, everybody says the same thing. And I, I said the same thing when I was, I was starting out. I went, okay, so that's what you play. That's a, okay, what do I play when the chords change? Not I'll worry about. 
Just play that. And it's like, yeah. So they don't teach you unless you're with a jazz instructor to play through changes from an right. early, from an early start, you know, like, so here, here, here's, here's how most guitar players end up going about it. Right. So you get the first instructor and he's like, he's like, here's an, a, here's an a minor pentatonic. Yep. Right. You can play this whenever you see an a, and that means either an a, an a minor, an a seven, a diminished seven. <laughs> and then it, try to play an a, pentatonic an a minor pentatonic in the normal box pattern against a a diminished chord and see how that goes for you that's right let me know how, let me how that works yes. let me know how that fifth works for you yeah yeah so actually i would love playing the fifth against a flatted fifth but that's because i'm nuts and because, that yeah. would <laughs> totally make my day um <laughs> this is like ring modulator anyone um no so uh i Actually, there's a, I, I think there's a song where that actually happens, and that's uh, off of Red by uh, King Crimson, and it's like a big yeah, but, function of that song. Um, but, but no, I, your point your point's like totally made. What I was going to say was that uh, really I think you could break everything down in that category if they just taught you a couple more shapes. Learn right. your A minor pentatonic, and then the next thing they should teach you is an A minor diatonic, and then right. the next thing they should teach you is A major diatonic, Right. And then the next thing they should teach you is a major pentatonic. And the reason why you should separate the minor pentatonic from the major pentatonic is because you will rely on both of those. <laughs> exactly. Learn them right together. They will not, you'll never be able to keep them straight. Right. And, and as you, as you use them, you'll know either when to use one or the other, or when you can do very, this. And very quickly you'll, right. And so very quickly you realize, once you realize you can move these scales around, suddenly you realize that there's these like grace notes that work really well against certain chords. And those aren't grace notes. It's modal. Like it's, it's really, it, you, sometimes it's a grace note. Sometimes you've got like a, like a, a flatted fifth or something in there, but more often than not, it's just a modal thing that you realize that this chord sounds or this note sounds really good against this chord. And yeah. you start to build those things. That's what I said. Like that's what most players do, right? Like they get right. get the minor pentatonic, and then they play it against everything, and then they start to realize these other notes. They're like one note higher or one note lower suddenly work against what they're doing, and so they start to expand their pentatonic scale, right? Um, mm. But that is not efficient if you want to learn guitar. Like that is a very very slow and arduous way to go about it, and so, it's very tedious. Yeah. Yeah, so that's why I'm saying like it would be far better if they were to be like, okay, so here's here's the deal. You you can take two approaches depending on the, what kind of chord progression it is. You can play the the tonic chord, either whatever scale that matches up with it, and then understand that if you have like if you if you so if you go to a if you go to a diminished like so, so it's what you're playing A minor right, and you have your typical A minor D minor. Um, e minor progression, so one four five in in a minor key, yep. and then all of a sudden the the uh, there's an A diminished in that. Yep. Okay, so what just happened? You didn't actually you had mo you modulated, right? Like, and that's what that's what the instructor should break down for you. He's like, okay, so you had the tonic, but it's not the same chord, which means you just modulated, or you've changed to. Uh, um, uh, I mean, actually, I'm considered the modulation too. If you were to change modes, right? right. So that's where I think people really miss like the educational side of like guitar instruction. And I'm, and I'm told that's why I want to get a copy of Steve Vai's uh, harmony book, but I've been yeah. told that that's what he deals with in his harmony book is this whole idea that like, okay, so we're going to talk about modes and what they are. And then we're going to give you some examples of how to use them and some basic chord progressions that go along with that. And he's not like when I hear theory book, you know what I think? I think Schoenberg art of harmony. Like I think like, late 1800s here yep. is all the colorful textures that we've ever used in symphonic music and why they are i mean that thing is literally it's like a bible yeah it's a, yeah it's, it's I, have you ever seen like that book those, it's yep. yeah it's like it's a bible like book chesapeake by uh james mishner it's Ch just huge it's and it, you know what i've read it i've, I've actually read the entire book oh, and, really? the, oh, and, and i retain maybe three to five percent of it and yeah. that, that three to five percent is really useful but it's yeah. it's one of those things where it's like if you don't so so right you know a lot of theory and right. your theory is applied theory in other words you use it to understand things around you Correct. that's what theory is supposed to do folks 
It's not supposed to tell you what to do. It's supposed to give you um, context. Right, to, and understand. Um, yeah, not even to understand, just to be able to discern and communicate about. Um, right. So I'll, I'll give you an example. That nothing I've ever written was as based in theory. What I do with theory is I break down what exists. Yes. So you I can don't remember create. those concepts. Right, exactly. And it helps me to remember. Because I've got to, when I walk on stage, I've got to know 50, 60 songs. And I cannot sit there and go, okay, let me go. Okay, this one, I go fifth fret with my index finger on the D string. And then I go to the seventh fret of the, <laughs> who has right. time for that shit? All right, buckle up because we're going for a ride. All right, let's do it. So here's the, here's the thing. If you, anybody who's a piano player out here or anybody who can sight read for guitar, you're going to be able to follow along with this really well. But I'm going to try to explain this concept for anybody who doesn't so that they can understand how much you can infer just knowing the rules of something. Yep. Um, when you're a piano player and you've learned to sight read, okay, the first three things you do when you look at a piece of music, the first thing you do is you determine what key is it, what the key is. That's right. Bass, treble, clef. That? Like the second thing you do is right. bass, treble, clef, and time signature. Right, those three things right. that are at the front of all you know pieces of music. Yep. The next thing you do, and I and it's so vital and so easy to understand when I say this, but the next thing you do is you determine what the hell the first note is, because yep. if you know the key, meaning you know what are what the sharps and flats are, and you know what that first note is, guess what. All you have to do is follow up, down, up, down, right. jump an interval, right. down, up, down, up, jump an interval, and you literally just follow along. It's not, right. it's not rocket science. That's how it's I learned to sight read. Really, singing. really easy. Yeah. To look at something and do that. However, the reason why it's harder on guitar is because you can have the same note in multiple positions. That's 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 right. basically all there is to it. That's right. Now, Knowing that context, knowing that those are really the three things you look for, right? You look for the key, time signature, you know, and then you look for the first note. Like when you put, when you take a piece of music, because you have the context and the rules, nothing, nothing else matters. And that's the, the parable to this. So like, I know it's a musical metaphor, but yeah. like knowing that this chord progression is one, four, five in a minor key, and then you have that diminished chord and then suddenly you've modulated. So you can infer, like, the, the diminished chord is usually a, a minor, like, the second chord in a minor progression. So you'd know, like, okay, so now I have an A, dimin or an a diminished, so I can use a G minor scale. Like, it's not rocket science. You just have to understand the rules behind it to help yourself. Right. That's, well, that goes to what I was talking about. So today when I was talking to that, you know, when I made that video for the guy, or yesterday when I made it, I gave it to him today, um, uh, because he lives in Japan. Um, one of the things that I did was it's pro he's probably our only Japanese listener. Um, I hope I hope he tells his buddies. Yeah, well, that's what he was saying. He said, "I got to show this to my instructor." So um, <laughs> his instructor's like, "I'm out of a job." <laughs> I said, "Yeah, well, I, yeah." I think it's just so that he can say, "Look, this is a little bit more of what I can get." But anyway, so um, uh, when I did that, I said, "Okay, it's it's D, but it's also F major," and so right. I played D. And I said, this is what it means by a mode. If I take that D, but I move it to F, and I start the same thing, but I start in F, guess what? I've got F major. Instead of D aeolian, I'm in F major. I, I'm a major F myself. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, but, but anyway, then I, I said, now if you, know, if you know your major scale, if you know how to play the major scale anywhere, and I went, D -d 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 -d. Yeah. and I said, look, now I can play D aeolian. Oh, right. look, I just start on the D. And the guy was like, I cannot believe you, like, opened this book for me. You yeah. know, it was like, but I guess, it's, I guess it's more in the way I present it than because than, it's, it's easy enough to just say that. Um, you know, I, I forgot to mention another guy that's really good at that stuff, Rick Beato. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, about nine months ago, six to nine months ago, um, you were – talking about the uh, fretboard logic book for, for like the cage system. Right. Yep. Um, and it's so funny because I, look, I, I know where all of the pentatonic notes of a particular scale are based on the root note. Yep. And that's how I've, and, and now I can explain it better because we talked about on the show, but 
I know all of that stuff. Yep. And the cage system is great for so many reasons, but like I, I gotta say, moving to a seven string guitar has put it's the cage no system way. in so much no, no, no. It's even better now. Because oh. because now I'm you like say it went away. No, 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 no. Cause well, it's I never really had it to begin with, but now I understand like all these different positions a whole heck of a lot better because oh. they could just stack, you know. I got I gotta say this. You remember when I presented that? What I said was, if you had seven strings, it's so much easier to get if you had that invisible seventh string or you had a real one. And, and you could use it. Yeah, yeah. Cause, so, like, so, like, when you first pick up a seven string, the first thing you do is you go, okay, so I already know the pentatonic, it goes, one, it goes five, eight, you know, five, seven, five, seven, five, seven, five, eight, five, eight on, right. uh, you know, the E through E. Um, in an, in, for an A minor pentatonic. And then you're like, okay, so how, what are the next notes on the B string? Well, you already have a B string, so you know it's 5-8, 5-8, 5-7, 5-7, 5-7, 5-8, 5-8, which is, it totally makes sense, right? Yep. But here's the problem. You're never going to use that pattern because you don't start on a, on a low, a, or you don't start on a um, low A. B. Right. Right. You need to, it needs to be on the low, low B string, right? right? So instead, what you do is you go, 12 uh was it 12 14, yeah. 12, 14. no it's not 12, 12 it's, 15, uh, 12, 15. No, no it's 10 it's 10 13 oh 10 13 10 13, 10, 13. 10, 13. Yeah. there does no, 10 13 10 12 10 12 10 12 uh 9 you know 9 11 right, 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 uh, right. yeah no so way. so like you yeah. shift one over and then you go back up yep. so once you once you realize that and you put it in perspective you're like wait a minute i already knew this pattern this is the you know this is really the third pattern of a minor pentatonic and i'm like right. Oh, this is easy. Like I can do yep. this. And then you know the, the funny part is I'm lazy. So the first thing I do is like I'll play with that pattern, and then I go right back as fast as I can to the to the one in five seven because I'm like all my stuff works over here. It's fine. Well, what I do, what yeah. So with a seven string, and and even when I play a six string, I imagine that seven string. It's just like when I play four string bass. Yeah. I can imagine the fifth string. You're like, dang it. <laughs> You're yeah. like, I can't go there. <laughs> because that's what I was talking about. The patterns at that point become an entire circle. Yes. You can just imagine a helix around the guitar that goes from the from the first one, whatever one, whatever position that is, to the other end. And as long as you remember that you've got to come back around, the helix returns. But now that it's a helix, literally a helix on the seventh string. Yeah. It just, it just well, literally rotates all the way through. And the better part, yeah, the better part of the seventh string is that if you know where you're where you're uh your whole steps, not yeah. your, so you have half step, half step, whole step. Like if you know where yeah. your two yeah. your two half steps together are, yeah. all, that's all you need. You don't need anything else. You literally don't need anything else. It's almost like there's, a, you know, I see all these things. Crack the code of the guitar. Yeah, and, there ain't no you know, code. For fifty dollars, I'll I'll send you the secret to play. I don't battery. know how many people I've seen on YouTube with that chart. That has like all the notes on the fretboard marked, and you're like, "Why? Why? Why? <laughs> yeah, no shit. They're all they're all notes. You're right. Yay. All you need to know is the C major scale. If you know that, you can figure out any other note you want. <laughs> Everything. Everything, folks. It is not a secret. It is there is <laughs> no it, it, there is. You don't have to pay money for that. But here's here's the thing that I think that people want. There's that instant gratification. I'm not I'm not trying to to um, insult anybody who's gone out and bought. And, and we've talked family. about this before. Everybody needs to take lessons at some point. <laughs> That's right. And and here's the thing. Here's the only thing you if you're not willing to sit down and memorize a few things, you're not going to get it. No, they're absolutely just right. like anything. Right. They are right. But it's just like when somebody sells you a diet pill and says, you know what? If you take this diet pill and go jogging three times a week, you'll lose weight. Well, here's what you could also do. Not take the diet pill and go and jogging. Stop eating. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Stop overeating. That's what I've been doing. So I'm, on a, I'm on a huge binge of trying to lose 100 pounds, but it's got to be over over a year. So Yeah, I'm but, working on the same thing. And it, yeah. I've been okay. Like I've been – dude. Oh, I, I've been. I'm terrible. I'm terrible at it, but I. You like, get, I ate. I bought a salad. Did anybody hear that, Jim? I, Jim, I, I'm. I have a confession to make. My dog just moaned. Jim, He's like, I "Oh a, my god!" Because I get no leftovers. 
for everybody online in the group, I have never eaten a salad. Never. Not in my entire life eaten Are a salad. Are you serious? Absolutely you serious 100% right serious. Uh, so I used to be – now anybody that meets me in person is going to go, oh, my God. Um, I used to be the thinnest, most – and and then when I started to gain weight, I gained because I was I was a bodybuilding type. I worked out hard, and I went to the gym. I bet you did. Constantly, constantly in the gym, constantly working out. And uh, it's only been over the last two years that I started really gaining weight. So anyway, this, I'm bringing this to guitar now. You have to get in the gym. And you have to make changes in your eating habits to lose weight. You have to get on the guitar and stop getting on social media. You can listen to this podcast in the background because all you want to do is sit down and go, you know, and play your scales. I would recommend both, but I would think that you need 90% of your time should be spent playing. 10% of your time should be spent bitching about gear on Facebook. That's right. And, and I, made a, I made a promise to myself today because I don't watch a lot of TV. Those of you who, who, who know me know that I, I watch about maybe 50 hours total per year of passive entertainment. In other words, I'm not talking about like um, uh, videos that, that I can sit down and play to. I'm talking about... Now he doesn't watch any of mine. No, I watch yours. I, <laughs> I was playing along with your stuff that you were doing today, by the way. But um, no, I I um, sit down and like like if you were to talk Game of Thrones, or you're talking about stuff like that. Um, so maybe fifty hours a year, and that's a lot for me. And I but I've been lately, I've been on social media way too much, and that's got to end. And so I said to myself today, I said, "All right, you know what? Five hours a week." yeah so you know we have the facebook group like i'm involved in that that's really the only thing i do on social media anymore that yeah. instagram but i do instagram just because of the show like my other instagram my own personal instagram account is basically dead i don't do anything yeah um but so i don't i just don't have the involvement there anymore like i if i was promoting a record or something like that'd be one thing yeah. which may end up happening soon i been toying around with the idea i've been writing some tunes um and i'm talking about like going to fiverr and hiring hired guns to yeah. play on it um it's not a cheap thing to do but no. it it may be something that i end up doing i mean i could make a whole record for like two grand samurai guitarist did a song where he he used fiverr to do the whole thing all he did was a chord progression and then threw it out there and it was yeah. about 140 dollars yeah, well, so your your mileage may vary. That's I was mixing and yeah, everything. No, but my point is like your mileage may vary because I've seen some uh, I've seen some people with some pretty negative reviews. Like we'll do a complete bass track professionally. Oh, that's and then they're like audio quality was terrible. Like you guys, gotta remember, yeah, you gotta remember. Bago, uh, <laughs> yeah, you gotta remember it was one hundred and forty five dollars at five bucks a pop. That's a lot of five dollar mistakes in there. Yeah, yeah. he he hired. He hired someone to write the lyrics. He hired someone to sing the lyrics. <laughs> he actually had to. I'm he, play went, he went avant garde with it. Like he's yeah. like, I don't really want to do anything. I just want to hire a bunch oh. of people to make music. Here's a, here's a base. Yeah, here's a basic chord progression. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Keyboards, bass, drums. Um, uh, he obviously went back and did guitar, but keyboards, bass, drums, singing, um, mixing, and um, what do you call the other thing? Um, mixing and uh, mastering. All done. Yeah, go ahead. You'll see when we go to GearFest, I could potentially track everything at my house and then rent one of their studios for a day yeah. and literally just do all my guitar tones. You know, have them all like pre-done and yeah. then go in with an amp, rent their studio for a day. For, yeah. I think it's like, they said it's like 800 bucks a day for one, yeah. of their, for one of their smaller studios and then use their like thousands of dollar mics to oh, yeah multiply mic my rig and yeah. make it sound like a million bucks yeah. and they won't and they won't just like so if you go in and you're like i really want to use this guitar in this song they'll bring out the guitar that you need like if they have yeah. one um, yeah. but the thing is um 
I have basically what I need in terms of gear. I just don't have a good like live space to record it. And there's some local guys around here. I could probably call around and find a decent live room. Um, but that may be the way I go is like, I'll just do all my guitars at home on, you know, like direct input with, yep. uh, and then reamp them when you take them to- somewhere and reamp them. Cause I can't reamp at my parents. Like I can't do any room miking or anything like that there. Right. So, um, but yeah, so it, this may happen. This might be a fantasy. It might be a flash in the pan. I think it'll be a cool project to embark on. Um, and then of course, at the end of the day, like I'll release the songs and you guys in the group and whoever can have them. And you know, they'll be available on when you stream them, they'll make me money. Um, exactly. it'll be a small amount of money. Like I'll make like 10 cents. Hey, yeah. you know, my, my black death doctor song, the one that, that, um, the one that I played for you. Yeah. I made 67 cents on that last year. All right. So people you actually listen to it. W nine for that. No. Uh. <laughs> I think it's got to be over a dollar for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I pro- with my luck, it probably did push me in the next tax bracket. I, I, and so I have a lot of friends that are pros on Facebook and stuff. And and one of the things that, that they'll do for fun is to is to post their Spotify checks, right? I mean, they blank out. Yeah, the, the yeah. They're, like, they're like 37 cents or and like five bucks. there's this whole pile of leading – what I love that Spotify does is they give them all – whole pile of yeah, leading so you can't heroes anything on the on the check by hand right like it would, <laughs> do that, you know yeah and it's like zero 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 twenty seven cents one guy was like i'm going to mcdonald's and he got like five dollars and 65 cents yeah yeah it's like i dude you can't even buy anything at mcdonald's for five and bucks anymore like i want to say yeah like i don't remember if it was forty five thousand or hundred forty five thousand places i'm like Dude, coffee and a biscuit at McDonald's right now is like six ninety nine. I know. Like, I crazy. stopped and I got a cheeseburger at Wendy's on the way home because my stomach was all aggravated. I knew I needed to eat something. Yeah. So I stopped and <laughs> it was ten bucks. Ten bucks for a cheeseburger. I'm like, are you kidding me? I know, right? I, I here I, I am I, complaining I, about eleven dollar strings, and here's a burger for ten bucks. Dude, yeah. dude, I ate a pack of strings. Think about that for a minute. That's right. You know, it, you know that the um, the economy is going to crap. I oh yeah, no, it's pretty clear. I buy, I, I drive a hybrid, right? And I can, <laughs> I, I bought gas for the first time in like weeks, and I pull in, and I went two sixty nine. When did this happen? <laughs> what? They were like, they were like, yeah, you guys got uh, it lucky. We, it's like two seventy four here or something. Yeah, they were like, um, Jim, it's been over two fifty for a long time. I said, I bought gas last at two thirty-two. Yeah, well, that's, that's how fast. It's your own fault. <laughs> yeah, <I> mean, <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It'll it'll only take me a tank and a half to get to gear. You got the hybrid. You save money on that. That's great. I yeah. think. I think. Listen, I'm all. Let me let me get philosophical for a minute. I don't normally like to share political opinions on the show, but right. I will say this much. We should all be conservationists right now, all of us. And there's a reason for it. It's not because I'm a bleeding heart liberal, because if you know me, you know that's absolutely not true. Right. Um, It's because what do we do, right? What do you and I do? Every product Mm -hmm. that you and I put our hands on for this show or the, the way of life that we have chosen as musicians involves wood. Wood. It involves plastic therefore oil it involves metal which is something that's not renewable nope. um and all these different things and it's not just that like everything we do in our in our, our day-to-day lives involves those things so when i hear you're driving a hybrid i'm i'm happy that you're saving money on gasoline but i also know and i want to stress this to everybody like jim doesn't do that to save the environment jim does that because it saves money on gasoline right and really hybrids There's don't a giant have- battery in the back of that car <laughs> Really don't help the environment. Those batteries are terrible yep. for the environment. They're, Horrendous. they're way worse than any car that's on the road today. I can't fold my back seats down, and I can't um, use my trunk. The yeah, whole that makes the, that the cabin environment I, of your car terrible. <laughs> cannot imagine. Yeah, I cannot imagine when that battery finally has to come out. That, that's going to be the end of the car for me. So every mm-hmm. car, every car, that's a hybrid, right? The yep. batteries are lithium ion based. Yep. which means they 
anything that, that involves the um, really any hazardous chemicals, but lithium specifically puts a lot of greenhouse gas into the air when they make them. And then when they ship the batteries to the United States, because they're not made here in the States, unless no. you buy a Tesla, they're not made here. They get right. shipped in a giant oil tanker to, mm-hmm. to the States in these, you know, those giant like Mirsk carriers you see driving around. Yeah. Um, and then they, and then they bring them here and they install them in these vehicles that then run around and, and also put off greenhouse gas, yeah. which is not a big deal. Cause it's kind of offset by the fact that you're not using as much gasoline, but at right. the same time, like you're still putting it out there and you have this giant battery in the back. So it's like, I, it's I, eventually got to go into a landfill. I'm not poo-pooing what you're doing, Jim. I think it's great that you're trying to save money. That's important too, because I think there's an economic thing. That's a whole component of this, but right. like, I want to stress to our listeners, we have major problems with wood production today. Like Bob Taylor has, has done a lot to try and preserve his well-being and also the well-being of some of the woods that they prefer to use in their instruments. Yep. Um, if you really want to learn about music conservation, and I'm not talking about like conservation music in schools, but I'm talking about like how do we keep making instruments the way we've been making them if we keep making garbage that goes into the dump because right. nobody wants that instrument to begin with. Right. Like that's why. Yeah. So think about this: all those Squire affinities that you see in the garbage, because um, they do end up in the garbage. Many of them do. Uh, it's just another guitar that can't be made for somebody with the right feature set and the right stuff. So I, I kind of want to stress like this is that we are at the point where right now we kind of have to say to ourselves, do we want to continue to reward a market where we continue to buy these ultra cheap guitars and continue to like, it's like, for example, um, we always talking about earlier, the wood conservation thing. Ebony is, is almost extinct. There's like two fourths of Ebony left in the world. And they, they've been cutting down these trees and, and they've been looking at the wood grain patterns and literally burning them because they're not plain black ebony. And you're sitting there going, wait a minute. We only have two forests in the world. Right. We're throwing ebony away. Well, yeah. And that's why when, when people like, like PRS and Fender's done this. And they I started to use it. streaked ebony. Yeah, the, the they should. and and um, uh, they've been using woods that are reclaimed from buildings that are being torn down. That's an, I, another great thing. So I'm driving down my highway right now. Well, not right this second, but every day, right? When I go down the highway, what am I seeing? I'm seeing trees being cleared because they're going to put um, a thing. And I'm like, why aren't these trees going into something renewable? You know what they're going into? Wood chips. Perfect example is um, Nick Bongers. He has a reclaimed pine Telecaster, which is a beautiful guitar. I've seen it. Um, and that is a great use of like a torn down building. Take the wood and do something with it. And I don't care if, it, you know, because at this point, like we have to slow down the, look, wood is a renewable resource as far as I'm concerned. Like every system in entropy is eventually going to decay. Nothing you can do about that. But wood will probably outlast us. If we preserve it, but we're not preserving it. We're doing things like chopping down all the ebony so that we can put it into these guitars that will eventually end up in a landfill because, yep. because nobody wants to pay enough to buy like a quality instrument that this heirloom quality they want to keep for the rest of their life. They want to buy something, mod the crap out of it, and then when they get bored with it, flip it. And then eventually that body gets junked because, you know, whatever reason. Like the guy took the neck off of it, put it on something else, and then put the body in the garbage or whatever. Like you know, you know, what I mean, like that that stuff happens. It goes to the storage for five years, and then somebody throws it out. I'm like, yeah, I'm already talking about you know changing out the neck on my telecaster. So. Yeah, so just you know, try to be conscious and try to be responsible about that kind of stuff because I think, um, like, with my playing, like, okay, so I have eight guitars right now, and we're talking about reselling and slimming down because I'm going to get another Kiesel. That's going to happen. Um, yep. And every time I part with like three or four guitars at once, so I can get something else. I kind of sit there and I, and I scratch my head and I think to myself, wow, I really hope these guitars don't end up in the landfill because then I feel like I contributed to this problem, which really what I want is I just want to have two guitars that I can use to do pretty much everything I want because then I don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah. So I don't know. That's me. That's me being enough. 
philosophical, Dave, for a bit. I've been philosophical a lot this episode. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot too. Like I could turn these two right here into one elite. And uh think about swapping necks. Swap, it's cross Wait, so Are you gonna swap some necks? No, no, no. I mean bringing them back while I've still got the ability to. Yeah, because you get elite. one elite. You want an elite telecaster? Yeah. Because yeah, you got a um they've got a telecaster. You don't need a tram. Line. You don't need one. No, I know. They they've got a telecaster thin line. Um you still got your equal though? to the two of the, the cost of those these two. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't need one. Exactly. All right, man. We have been on this for about two hours now. Yep. So I have been David. I've been Jim. And tonight we have been the philosophical practical guitarists. Very good.